Hey guys, welcome to the first ever Chi Analysis lesson. The topic of this lesson is Introduction to Structure Analysis. In this lesson, I will be introducing you guys to the course Structure Analysis. We'll be looking at three basic subtopics, which are classification of structures, connections, and role of structure analysis in structure engineering projects. Without further ado, let's dive into today's lesson. The first question for today is, what is structure analysis? Before we can answer this question, we first have to know what structures are. A structure is a body subjected to a system of loads and deformation takes place and resistance is set against the deformation. First of all, we're going to be looking at what loads are and what deformations are. Loads, when I talk about load, basically loads are heavy or bulky things that has been carried or about to be carried. But in structure, we see load as external forces acting on a body. Now we're going to be expatiating more on loads in the next lesson. But for now, we're just going to give the definition and know what loads are. Moving on to deformation. Deformation is simply the change in shape of a body caused by the application of a force, which we know as load. So let's take a very quick example to clarify what deformation is, an example that everyone can relate with. So a rope line, for example, which is usually straight, and it's a straight because there, there is no load applied to it. But when a load is applied, let's say um, a heavy, no, not, really, not necessarily heavy, a wet duvet is hung on the rope line, it tends to take another shape. Before it was this shape, now it's taking this shape. Now we can say that deformation has occurred. This type of deformation is called bending. And there are different types of deformation. It could be bending, it could be twisting, it could be shearing, and so on and so forth. Also, we can simply say that structures are means of transferring loads from a certain point to some other points. They could be statistically determinate or indeterminate. In subsequent videos, I'm also going to explain what statistically determinate or indeterminate structures are. Having understood what structures are, we can now move on to structural analysis. Now, structural analysis has to do with the prediction of the performance of a given structure under prescribed loads. One of the most important decisions made by a structural engineer in implementing an engineering project is the selection of the type of structure to be used for supporting or transmitting loads. So you can see why structural analysis is very important in structural engineering. So that's all about the definition of structural analysis. We're going to be talking about the first subtopic for today, which is classification of structures. Now, structures are classified in various ways, but I have two most comprehensive ways of classifying structure, which I'm going to teach you today. Now, the first one is classified based on the type of primary stresses that may develop in their members on their major design loads. They're classified into five. First of them is tension structures. Second, compression structures. Thirdly, we have trusses. Fourthly, we have shear structures. And lastly, we have bending structures. I'm going to be expatiating on these type of structures or rather classification of structures one by one. So starting with tension structures. The members of tension structures are subjected to pure tension under the action of external loads. That simply means these structures are composed of mainly flexible steel cables which are frequently employed to support bridges and long spar roofs. So examples of tension structures are steel cables and vertical rods and so on and so forth. So if you have a problem knowing what vertical rods are, vertical rods are used as hangers to support balconies or tanks. Yeah, that's what tension structure is all about. Moving on to compression structures as... Tension structures, compression structures also develop compressive stresses under the action of external loads. So common examples of compression structures are columns and arcs. 
Columns of straight members subjected to axially compressive loads. So what we can see from tension structures and compression structures are mainly tension structures usually deal with steel, while compression structures usually deal with concrete. Yeah. So moving on to the third one, which is trusses. Trusses are composed of straight members connected at their ends by hinge connections to form a stable configuration. When loads are applied to a truss only at the joints, its members either elongate or shorten. So for a truss, loads are only applied at its joints. Now here's an example of what a truss looks like. Yeah, so this is what a truss looks like. You can see that loads are just applied at the joints and not on the members. So looking at the fourth classification, which is shear structure. Now, examples of shear structures are reinforced concrete shear walls, and they are used in multi-story buildings to reduce lateral movements due to wind loads and earthquake excitations. So talking about the last one, bending structures. Now, bending structures mainly develop bending stresses under the action of external loads. Examples of bending structures are beams, slabs, rigid frames, and so on and so forth. Um, for frames, beams, and slabs, I'm going to expatiate more on them in subsequent videos. But for now, I want to quickly tell you what frames are. Frames are composed of structural members connected together by either rigid or hinged connection to form a stable configuration. They are commonly used in multi-story buildings. They could also be used in bridges and industrial plants. So for frames, external loads are applied on both members and joints. But for trusses, external loads are applied on only joints. So here's an example of what a frame looks like. So you can see the external loads are applied on both the members and the joints. That's for frames. So talking about the second classification, which is based on dimension, it's classified into three. We have one dimensional, which are also known as skeletal structures. We have two dimensional, which is also known as surface structure. We have three dimensional, which is known as solid structures. Now for the one dimensional examples are trusses, frames, grids, cable structures, and so on and so forth. While examples for two dimensional or surface structures are slabs, shells, walls, etc. Lastly, examples of three-dimensional, which are solid structures, are foundations, retaining walls, gravity dams, and what have you. So that's that for the first subtopic of today. If you've enjoyed the teaching so far up to this level, you can go ahead and hit the like button and also subscribe to my channel. And if you want updates, you can hit the notification button. If you have any questions or anything you want to say to me, you can always drop your comments in the comment section. I would really appreciate your comments. Moving on to the next subtopic for today, which are connections. I'm going to give you the definition of connections and the types of connections. Connections are structural elements which are used for joining different members of a structural steel framework. There are three types of connections, but we use two. I'm going to give you the reason why the third one is not used. We have the rigid connection, we have the flexible or hinged connection, and lastly, we have the semi-rigid connection. Now, the semi-rigid is recognized by structural steel design codes, but it's not commonly used in practice. So we are going to talk about just the rigid and the flexible or hinged connection. The rigid connection is a rigid joint or connection that prevents relative translations and rotations of member ends connected to it. They are usually represented by points at the intersection of members on the line diagram of the structure, something like this. You would see that they are represented by points. Those are rigid joints which prevents relative translations and rotations. If you have a rigid joint, 
The member will not be able to rotate nor translate. Talking about the hinged joints or the flexible joints. This connection prevents only relative translations of member ends connected to it. That is, all member ends connected to a hinge joint have the same translation but may have different rotations. What this simply means is that it prevents just translations. So the members can rotate, but they, they might not rotate in the same way. So joints are capable of transmitting forces, but not moments between the connected members. They are represented by small circles at the intersection of members on the line diagram of the structure. For the last but not the least subtopic we have today, which is role of structural analysis in structural engineering projects. It's not new that structural analysis is an integral part of any structural engineering project. I'm going to use a flow chart to demonstrate the role of structural analysis in structural engineering projects. This flow chart is simply going to show you the various phases of a typical structural engineering project. We have six phases. The first phase is the planning phase. The second phase is the preliminary structural design phase. The third phase is the estimation of loads. The fourth phase is the structural analysis. The fifth phase is the serviceability and safety check phase. While the last phase is the construction phase. I'm going to be explaining all the phases I just mentioned in details. Planning phase. We will talk about planning phase. This is like the most important phase in any structural engineering project. This phase usually involves the establishment of the functional requirements of the proposed structure. Also involves the consideration of the type of structure you could consider using a truss or a rigid frame. Just consider the type of structure that may be feasible. Also the types of materials to be used. It could be structural steel. It could be reinforced concrete, it could be both. It may also involve consideration of non-structural factors such as aesthetics, environmental impacts of the structure. This stage requires knowledge of construction practices and thorough understanding of the behavior of structures. If you do not have a good understanding of structural analysis, then <laughs> you cannot move on from the first stage. Talking about the second stage, which is Preliminary structural design. In this stage, the sizes of the various members of the structural system selected in the planning phase are estimated based on approximate analysis, past experience, and code requirements. What this simply means is that from the first stage, we selected sizes of various members of structural system. So in this stage, in the preliminary structural design stage, those various sizes of members are estimated based on approximate analysis, past experience, and code requirements. The member sizes selected are used in the next phase to estimate the weight of the structure. In the stage of estimating loads, the loads expected to act on the structure are simply determined. You might be wondering what type of loads act on structures. All these I'm going to explain in the next video, so stick with me. The fourth stage, which is our major concern for today, is the structure analysis stage. The value of the loads estimated from the third phase are used to carry out any analysis of the structure in order to determine the stresses in the members and the deflection at various points of the structure. After you have gone through your structural analysis stage, the next stage is your safety and serviceability check stage. In this stage, we are meant to determine whether the requirements of serviceability and safety are satisfied. Now, if the requirements are satisfied, you can move on to construction phase. But if they are not satisfied, you revise the structural design. What revising the structural design simply means is that if the core requirements are not satisfied, then the member sizes are revised and phase three through five are repeated until all the safety and serviceability requirements are satisfied. Meaning if your serviceability check 
and safety requirements are not satisfied, you go back to your phase three, which is estimation of loads. You estimate your load again. You carry on structure analysis and you check. That will be all for this lesson. And I really hope that you learned something new. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and drop your comments. And thanks for watching.